you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> Is it on? <laughs> it's on. It's on. <laughs> We just talked for 20 minutes and it wasn't on. Uh, so, you so know. Take two. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I was really funny. Oh, yeah. Take, so. her, take her word for it. <laughs> 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 oh, welcome to Scuttlebutt Podcast. I am Rich. And I'm Sandy. And today we're going to talk to you a little bit about muskrat trapping because that is our first season of the 2018-19 trapping season. Isn't it funny, though? I mean, the, as rough as the... Uh, our muskrat season has been has been getting off to mm-hmm. that this podcast about muskrats has, has been rough too <laughs> yeah it has but you know what give it another go <laughs> so why is it is uh are we having difficulties why are we having well uh, the biggest part is that we're we are trapping earlier this year than yes. than what we have and i don't know why but he's having a real hard time um with the traps <laughs> Well, <laughs> I, I I know how to set them. It's kind of like riding a bike that way. But I mean, I'll admit there's a little rust on the chain. I mean, I, I haven't caught myself. I mean, no, you, you've been trying. And I've been filming just in the event that he does snap his fingers into either a body grip trap or, or one of those nice little <laughs> what is little it? spring or coil spring traps. Yeah. Yeah. So we have... Uh, our trapping season uh, kicks off on October first, and this is the uh, this is what the, the eighth eighth today. Yes, it's our youngest son's second anniversary today. Yeah, we just celebrated thirty nine a day or two ago. That's right, three days ago. Anyway, um, beaver and muskrat, uh, fox, wolf, and coyote all all open on the first of October, and none of the canines are anywhere near prime, even this far north, and the beaver really isn't either. But the muskrat, if we're going to get at the muskrat, we have to do it now before it freezes. Yeah. And this year, a little sooner than what we had originally intended, because normally we don't start till closer to the end of October. Yeah. But we had snow here on the 11th of September. Yeah. And, it, and then we had some brutally cold temperatures, so minus 7 um, well, we went to, the Celsius, one night- so that's just about 0 no, no, 17. We we went down to set minus 17, which is just about zero Fahrenheit. Oh. Yeah. So, did it get that? I didn't realize it got that yeah, cold. Yeah, I did. Well, there you go. The danger of that is the, when those ponds freeze, especially the small ponds that we target for for uh, muskrat, and then when they, when they freeze like that, unless you get uh, some really intense sun and some wind with it, mm-hmm. they, that ice never comes off again. Yeah. And a half inch of ice is enough to screw us up in the canoe. Oh, Absolutely. Yes. And it's done that before. Yeah. <laughs> we had floats out one year and we got a surprise mega frost that put a half inch of ice on the little pond, not very far from where we live actually. So that was good because we were exhausted from, <laughs> from pushing our way and smacking our way through all that ice to get our traps out and whatnot. It was just kind of brutal. Yeah, well, you thought it was kind of funny to begin with because you're up front breaking ice, and then when I was, and I was paddling, and uh, let me tell you, you cannot get a canoe up to ramming speed. <laughs> mm. No, you cannot. <laughs> it never becomes an icebreaker. It never gets on top of the ice and slides either. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not enough ice to walk on to slide a canoe on. You know, maybe the problem was maybe there was too much weight in the front of the canoe that we just couldn't pop up on top. Is that where you're going to go? <laughs> really? It's only because he's on film that he's brave enough to say such things. <laughs> okay, well, I, I owed you one from <laughs> earlier today. <laughs> well, I have to tell you from earlier today. So we're out today, and we're when we're picking up our traps because we were going to move to another pond. And I'm filming, and when I'm not filming, I'm paddling to the next set, and then I'm filming. And it was anyway. I didn't realize that Rich had his toque on at such a cone-headed angle. Let's just say that. He looked like one of the cone heads off of SNL. <laughs> so she's trying to take a picture. Uh, you know, we're doing a little hero picture at the end there. If we put up Instagram and all that stuff. And then she starts laughing and she can't breathe. And I was like, I don't know what's going on. I'm looking around like, you know, what what, what on earth? She, she starts talking about my toque. Well, it wasn't like I just put it on. <laughs> it had been I, on all day? I, yeah, all day. And she filmed <laughs> me all day with this on. Those of you on watching this on YouTube will see the picture. <laughs> I got to say, it's funny. It really is. Very unintentional, though. 
Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was. Yeah. yeah. So the, our biggest problem, the reason why we have to use canoes is, is uh, to get around for rats is the only way to c- cover a lot of ground quickly, yeah. only way to move a, enough gear quickly. Yeah. Uh, our ponds all have mud bottoms. Very, very few have any sand, and it's not for very far that there'll be any sand or anything yeah. like that. It's all mud bottom, and you just can't walk in it. You know, you might only have that much, you know, a foot of, of water, and then, then there might be two feet of muck underneath mm-hmm. it. So you got to get around and uh, use a canoe, and that, and that ice can, can uh, defeat you very in a big hurry. The other thing that we, why we really target a lot of fall muskrats, even though they're not at their peak prime until later in the year, mm-hmm. is that muskrats are rodents and they're not very bright, and they pick a lot of really bad, make a lot of bad choices. They're kind of like, Teenage kids, teenage boys, you know, oh. here, here holding a beer. <laughs> They're kind of like, like teenage boys and make a lot of bad choices and, and uh, they pick places where they can't survive the winter. And lots of times I've had so many folks say to me, you know, you should see this pond. It is just covered in, in muskrat push-ups and I can't wait till spring and then there's nothing come spring. Yeah. You know, they just don't make it. So we do most of our trapping in the fall. We do some in the spring depending yeah. on the on, on the breakup. But uh, we do a little bit of, of winter trapping, for, uh, and it's through uh, for the push-ups, right? <laughs> what are you laughing about? <laughs> I was just thinking about last spring. When <laughs> Anybody saw the show? <laughs> Richard took his phone for a little swim. <laughs> Good Lord. I'd make more money on a trap line if I, could, if I could quit drowning and losing phones. Although one of them, I didn't lose. <laughs> That's really not worth talking oh, about. Oh, it is so. <laughs> <laughs> That's really not worth talking Not when it's you that destroys an $800 phone. <laughs> I lost it. I didn't destroy it. I have it. Yeah. We found it again. Odd story. We were, we were traveling around in the Argo. And I put it in the, in the pocket of my jacket, but I hadn't zipped it closed. Yeah. And somehow it bounced out, hit the track of the Argo, didn't get run over, just laid on a on a... Uh, like a track, and it's funny because that was upside not upside down. That was just past where we we'd, we'd been doing a little mm-hmm. bit of scouting. So it was just past where I'd, I'd normally go, and I normally I, I, I about a hundred yards short of that spot, I take and make a turn and, and head back to the uh, east. And so we never went over it all winter long, and it, that was we were setting up. Uh, it was in November. Mar- yeah, it was in yeah. November, and I, we found it when we we found March, it in April. Mar- I think it was April because the snow was gone. Yeah. And it was a black phone, and it was um, laying face down. Laying face down, and we just drove up to it. So we have it. We dried it. Well, it didn't even really need no. to be dried out, and it was fine. So that's my phone now, because <laughs> you got a new one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we do target uh, them a little bit in the winter time, in the peak of the winter, when they are in their in their best condition. But most of the reason why why we don't do a lot of uh, winter rats is that. Uh, most most uh, the good muskrat trapping, especially in Alberta, is in the farmland. Uh, our big bush line where we spend them all the winter on, it's a very tough place for, for muskrats. And they yeah. do populate up a lake, and then the, the mink and the, and the otter find the lake, and, yeah. and they take care of them. But uh, when I do find uh, a lake when I'm traveling around doing um, usually Martin and, and that, I, I find a lake that has uh, muskrat push-ups on it. Then we'll go back and target them. I guess I should explain what a push-up is. Yeah. It's actually kind of cool. The um, colony that the muskrat lives in is made out of either reeds or cattails, around here any reeds, mm-hmm. cattails, sometimes some mud in some places, that kind of stuff. But it's usually attached to the shore or, or in, the, in the weeds itself, yeah. right? And that's where they actually live in. Now, a push-up isn't something that they live in. The push-up is built on the ice yeah. and it's out away from the shore. And what it is is that as the ice starts to form in that, they... they take weeds off the bottom yep. and they take and push them up through a little hole and as they push them up and it's really funny because this stuff comes up and it's and it looks like a like, like a coke can cylindrical yep. yep and just pushed up like uh like a folded up um you know dryer vent hose right yep. you know that that kind of thing takes they take and shove it up and they keep shoving it up and shoving it up and it becomes insulation so that yep. they can then come up on top of the ice inside this little dome well what that push up is for is it's his his breath of air he needs to get from his colony under the ice all the way out to where the food is, but he needs a breath of air to do it. Yeah. And so that that's what it allows him, him to come back up. So when you when you take in, and uh, you're trapping in those push-ups, yeah. 
you take and, and chop it open and pop it out, and it's usually the inside of it's just beautifully all nice you know, dome. Ice, ice dome, yeah. Yep. And and you put your your uh, foothold in there, and then you put it back down, and, and you pack it all up with snow and that because you don't want it to freeze. No, and we've used um, mostly those long spring, yeah, uh, one and a halfs. Yeah. Is that yep. about the size? Yeah. 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 We've used those in the um, in the push ups in the push ups, yeah. but. That takes a, a particular uh, a year when you find it. Now, the last couple of years, there hasn't been a lake that's had enough push-ups on it to target. Or, no. or I find them, I find them after the um, otter and, and mink have been there. And the otter and mink will actually dig a hole through the top of that push-up, go down and through, and chase uh, the muskrat. I mean, it's another way for them to get under the ice, and then it just freezes up. The mm-hmm. Muskrat doesn't get back in time to to uh, seal it yeah. back up again. So. When it comes to trapping muskrats, they are like just about the universal critter out there. And I think every kid starts with muskrats and squirrels, right? Probably. Yeah, around here, muskrats, squirrels, probably probably um, ermine, like weasel, yeah. uh, because they're they're all very, they, there's lots of them in the farm, uh, farm areas. And they're relatively easy to catch. Yep. Yeah. And there are more ways to uh, catch muskrats than there are to skin the vertebral cat, right? <laughs> <laughs> Probably. <laughs> but it breaks down into uh, into killing sets and drowning sets is, is probably the, the, the biggest, the first way we can break it down. And, um, when we talk about drowning sets, they're used in conjunction with water. But here's the funny thing. It's a misnomer. Yeah. A muskrat can't drown. Yeah. Yeah. They hold their breath. And they and it's this is an involuntary function. Yeah. They cannot make a choice about this. So if, yeah. if they're held underwater, they just gray out and fade to black and they're dead but they will they'll ne- there's never water in their lungs because they didn't drown yeah is that crazy nature yeah nature, nature is a powerful thing and uh, one of the ones that we don't use very much of though is the colony sets and a lot of our friends do though that that are down more central alberta way they have a lot a lot more pothole type things where where they set the colony sets so yeah. we don't we don't typically have too many of those about the best place that I use, uh, what they are is just wire cages that you sink underwater, and and you sink them on a spot where the where the muskrat go through. Amazingly, muskrat practically walk on the bottom. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people don't understand that; they think they're swimming through the water because you just see them sw- swimming on top of that. But when they're underwater, they they just about walk on the bottom because you can see their trails. It's crazy. Interesting. Yeah, it's very crazy. So, but the only place that we use. Uh, um, I like what's called a, fu- uh, a funnel trap, and it's just a big tube made out of wire, yeah. and it's got a funnel on each end yep. that has a one-way door in it. So the muskrat hit it, and they go through the middle, and then they can't get back out, and, yeah. and, and it's over very quickly. Usually at a culvert, yeah. you know, where there's running water through a culvert, that's a great place for that. Or if you, uh, our friends uh, down in the south there, they, they've got uh, uh, the muskrats coming in and out of these little potholes and that they have um, paths. Yeah. Or little canals, to, and and they take and just sink that uh, that colony trap, which is a square yeah. version of of the funnel trap. And they sink it down in in there, and they uh, actually can find. The, they're lucky in southern Alberta because they don't get the snow that we do. And well, so, most years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Calgary just got a big one, didn't they? Yeah, they should. Yeah, a couple of feet of snow there yeah. in October. Uh, but they can walk around on these frozen ponds, and they can see the bubble trails. Mm-hmm. Okay, so as the muskrat goes along, they're releasing bubbles uh, underwater. They can see these bubble trails, and they'll, they'll just take and chop a hole down through the ice and, and drop that that uh, colony down there. Yeah, but it works really good for them, right? Yeah. We don't. That doesn't happen for us. Most most of it here is uh, we're using the footholds, and yeah. we're using them in in a drowning situation. So the uh, they have to be a, a Round water where the where the trap and the muskrat are going to end up in the water, and they call it a drowner, even though it's not they're not drowning. But technically, <laughs> you mentioned that uh, there are two types of traps that we use there. there yeah. There's the coil spring, and there yeah. and there's the uh, the long spring. Yeah. So um, most recently, we've been using the hags. Um, the bracket. Bracket. Yeah. Have to get the right term in, <laughs> but um, we use just those little. They're, coil they're springs, one and a half coil yeah. springs, yeah. And they can, uh, they just easily, they don't clip. They just kind of um, they slide in. They slide in, and we set them 
Oh, depending on the day, I guess, but, you know, three inches or so below the surface of the water. Yeah. And then we put a little bit of carrot on a, on a I don't know what they're Hags, called. Hags has, a, has an actual bait holder clip. This right. all mounts on a three-eighths rod. Yeah. Uh, if you watched uh, the shows last year, you, you, you see them, um, four-foot or five-foot or six-foot three-eighths fiberglass rod, and, and that's what uh, the bracket is designed and to mount on. it's really and easy to adjust. So then, you know, as far as, as your body of water goes, depending on what sort of a bottom you have, like we have around here a lot of muddy, soft, soft bottoms, and, and then you can get that down long enough so that it's still enough of it sticks out of the water you can find it <laughs> yeah so like you say we, we the the bracket just slides and and because it's on this round rod it, it just wedges itself as soon as you take your hand off it it wedges and that's the height is that you set it two or three inches under under the water your your, your pan is is there i think they're one and a half dukes that we are using yeah and then up above it, it seems like the magic number is somewhere like eight to ten yeah. inches above the water. Yeah. We have the Hags has a a, spring, a, a little um, wire spring wire clip that, that mounts on you on the uh, pole on the itself. Pole. And yeah. that also, when you squeeze it, you can just Slide move it up. up and down really easily. And then so we just put a little bit of carrot on that, and it seems that the the muskrat want to use that trap that's about that big in diameter as a um, a ledge or whatever to grab at the carrot and typically we catch them by the hind foot. Yep. The trap springs, it comes off of the ho the bracket holder and falls into the water and Yeah, there's that's just, it. on this little bracket, there's a, there's a slot in the face of it that the tongue of the trap, you know how a trap has, uh, you have your, your uh, on the one side is, is your um, latch, your uh, for your pan and that, and then on the other side, there's that little that little tongue. Well, that tongue just slides into that slot, and that's what holds it. And as soon as it's disturbed with the with the rat or the trap going off, it pops out and into the water it goes. Yeah, uh, and, it, and the trap is heavy enough that it holds the rat. That's under. right. You can use smaller traps than that, but you need to add weight. Yeah. Now, to me, the ultimate uh, foothold trap for drowning situation with muskrats is like a one and a half long spring. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is is the weight. Yeah, it's heavy. Uh, lots of people talk about if you want to add weight to take and wire uh, uh, a large nut or whatever to the um, to the trap. And I prefer just to use a piece of chain. Add an extra foot of chain. They all come with that cheap double loop chain on them. Um, it it does the job. I, I shouldn't it's, say cheap. It's it, do, it does the job well and it's strong enough for what it's meant to do. But it has no weight. Yeah. So like a twist link chain, like a quarter inch twist link chain. And you don't have to add very much. No, a foot. Yeah. A foot is all it takes and the, and it just adds enough weight to, to, to make those those lighter traps uh, do do the job very well. The Hags uh, bracket system mm -hmm. on the pole doesn't work quite as quite as well with a with a long spring. I, I think you'd have to go with even small with a, a smaller long spring for, yeah. for it to work because the one and a half is is of course quite misbalanced for weight, right? Yeah, and but the other thing that we that we're doing with Hags is it's a different kind of clip, and we use a body grip on that. Yeah, yeah, we'll get to that in, in just a minute. Uh, one thing I want to talk about though is is with the um, the one and a halfs are usually very very powerful springs, and sometimes too powerful for for muskrat. Two problems that you have: one, when you've got uh, really really strong springs, uh, they can stand on that pan. Yeah. And it won't go off because there's just so much tension there, right? And then if it does. It's almost like they can cut it, cut them in half. Yeah. So, well, or you can cut a foot off. Yeah. So what I do is I, I either change out the spring to a weaker spring or you can. Uh, Use a 15, blow torch. Yeah, 15 seconds with a, with a blow torch and, and take yeah. some of the temper out. and Because uh, it, it just it takes nothing to hold them. No. You know, and. The one thing I wish I could figure out, maybe somebody out there could give us a tip on this. When they stand on that trap, they like to stand <laughs> either on the, the end of the springs yeah, or or on the jaws. It's it's like there's got to be some magic thing that we can do to make them step on the pan. Yeah. Like they don't know that the pan's any different than the jaws or whatever. They just no. run into the jaws first, I guess, but... Because yeah. I've I've got lots and lots and lots of footage of them them standing there on the <laughs> on the jaws. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, so the uh, 
the other system then, oh, I guess maybe we should talk about floats when we're talking about the leg holds, the drowning yeah. si- situation, the floats. Um, ours so are, they're about two feet long? Yep. And foot uh, wide. Foot wide. And we put that uh, styrofoam. SM. SM. Yep. On the on the bottom of them. And then they're kind of, they're, well, they can be plywood or, yep. or whatever on the top. And then we, uh, we have have it set up for a couple of either long spring um or the or the coil spring yeah i've I've got most of the coils on poles now so that yeah i mean the advantage of the of the coil springs on the poles is man oh man you can take hundreds at once in a canoe whereas uh, these one foot by two foot um uh floats are take up a lot of room and weight yeah they do get heavy don't they they are heavy especially when you're pedaling into a big wind Yeah, we haven't had to do that yet this year. I'm sure it's coming though. <laughs> I'll, I'll be sure to serenade you when I, I do. <laughs> I'm sure you will. So with, with the uh, with the floats, I just drill a two inch hole right down the center of the float, and then I just use a stake, uh, usually a four foot service stake, which yeah. in oil country is easy to come by. Down and and the biggest advantage that they've got over anything else, those floats, is that. They're automatically adjusting for, for water fluctuations. That's correct, yeah. Yeah. So if you're doing a canal or anything like that, they, they, they come up and down very, very easy, right? As long as they don't go right up. <laughs> water doesn't get too deep and they go off the top yep. and, and they're gone. And that's happened. <laughs> Especially with wave action, actually. <laughs> yeah. if you, we've got a really muddy body and we've got to sink that stake in a long ways. If it's if it gets really windy, boy, it, we, we're sometimes chasing those floats all over the lake. <laughs> So the other thing that we can use are, are killing traps, and that is the uh, body grips. So one tens are legal for for muskrat, but uh, I, I never buy one tens. I have a, a ton of one twenties for my uh, for my Martin, and yeah. that, that's what we use. Just I only just release one spring, is all right. So you can either put them on a foothold. I see lots of or not a foothold. Pardon me. Put them on a float. <laughs> Both start with F. It's been a long day. <laughs> <laughs> you put them on uh, on the float uh, where, you know, you have a carrot behind them. You know, lots of people will, will have a float where you have a wall and you have uh, a uh, trap on each end, right? And then just take and, and set that uh, killing trap right right in front of the wall with a carrot behind it. And then they, they, they try to go through the trap to get to the carrot. And, and uh that's one way to do it. The other way that we've been having very good success with is with the Hags spring clip, once again, on that three-eighths pole. Yeah. yeah. And again, it just holds it very easily adjustable for water height or what have you. And we put the carrot always before you set the trap, put it on the trigger. Um, and we, I mean, yeah, I guess you can use other kinds of, of bait, but we've found that carrots work the best we tried a beet actually this weekend <laughs> and i proved I mean, that nobody or nothing eats beets <laughs> <laughs> yeah anyway we tried the beet and nothing happened with that but there was a few carrots that didn't get eaten right in that little stretch too so carrots uh, is what we found to be a uh, parsnip might work I, I know a lot of people uh that uh, have good luck with parsnip another guy talks about how his neighbor has a crab apple tree and the crab apples hit the ground and they're that they're great muskrat yeah. bait they could be. And somebody told us about a puck, too, didn't they? Actually, I have some of them, yeah. and um, I haven't used them yet. Like an orange or a no, green? No, they're fluorescent green. They're green. They're fluorescent green. Yeah. They're, they're, they're this big, soft puck. Did you drink all your coffee? I need a warm-up anyway. <laughs> 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 so, bait is very important. I, I also think that... that uh, Something bright is is important. Like a car- a carrot is nice and bright, uh, parsnip that white is bright. Yeah. But you know something that we've we've had is I've I've used steaks. Like we take a survey steak that we've just robbed yeah. off one of the job sites, and it'll have a ribbon fluttering on it. Muskrats will eat that ribbon. Yeah, they will. I don't know what that's all about. I don't Does know. Does the ribbon attract them or? Color, I think anything that's maybe colorful or or stands out as being a bit different, like the carrot and the parsnip and whatnot. Yeah. And the and the fluorescent. Green hockey puck. I don't know. It's it's strange, but yeah. it 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 it, it is. Uh, it's been pretty neat that way. Um, and then we do. Uh, so we have that as the bait, but then we always usually you always usually <laughs> we usually um, use a lure as well. Should I tell you how cone headed your hair looks now? <laughs> 
probably does. Or, or just let you go for the rest of the just day. Just let you go for the rest of the day. It's all good. <laughs> so lure is important, and mostly because you uh, need need them to be able to smell it. They're, most of the time, they're they're active at night, and they're not going to be seeing it. So the the, the lure is is pretty dang important, and I find usually you know cabins makes a, a great one that um i think they call it bread and butter i think that's what it's called but it smells like it smells very wonderful different kind of mints and, let me tell and you sweet. it does not smell anything like <laughs> the the lure that we use for martin and fisher and wolverine it's probably one of the few animals that you will actually have a lure that you use that you don't object to <laughs> that's not offensive <laughs> or if you get on your fingers, it doesn't interfere with eating sandwiches. <laughs> yeah. That's why he brings me along, though, really, is just to make sandwiches without lure on his on, on the fingers. Yeah, well, <laughs> so in the fall, your your lures are going to be food-based. And they're going to be, you know, the castor is another one that's mm-hmm. used a lot. Mint is used a lot. Some people use toothpaste. We've used toothpaste. Yeah. Yeah. We've Some used- people, including us. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it caught caught rats. I yeah. don't can't prove it was a toothpaste, but <laughs> it, it still caught rats. Yeah. It was an attraction. It was cu- it was um, curiosity lure, right? Yeah. And I think that's that's important. The springtime, musky sex based lures yeah. are what works because that's what's on it's their mind. Breeding season, yeah. Then too, and in the fall, um, all the young are getting kicked out generally from their colonies, so they're traveling to other places, and and so that's. That's another way that that things go a little better for us in the fall. But you get too many in one place and they start biting and well, that's, scratching. That, that's and, springtime of the year when they uh, when it starts to become time for uh, mating. Then you have uh, fights over dominance, over territory, over sex. Guys would fight over sex? Mm. <laughs> what are the odds? <laughs> so it, it's... Uh, they quickly degrade. Like I mean, I'm, our season goes in the middle of fifth, uh, middle of, uh, of May, but never We've ever never trapped that late. Oh no, you can't because they they tear holes in one another, like ghastly holes. You cannot imagine how tough those animals are. Yeah, they just have you know innards hanging out when you catch I them, and, and they still survive and go on, right? Yeah, and I mean, if you're going to go to all the expense of trapping them, um, you want something at the end that's saleable. And anything with big gashes and rips in them isn't no. worth, it's not worth your time to uh, to put them up if they're that bad. Put up is sweet and easy when it comes to muskrats. They're, yeah, they're, they're easy really, to skin. They are really easy to skin. Basically, you open them up at the back end and then you shove your handy in, in up uh, up to his head like and turn them inside out just like you would a sock. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. That's about it. Couple, a couple of cuts around the around the nose, but it's important that you dry them first before before you start out skinning them because it just goes so much better. Well, you're right, and it's really important that they're dry when you put them on the board. Yeah. So one of the things that we do, um, and and we wondered how you know, because up here, if you leave them outside, they're not going to dry, uh, not very well anyway. And no, they're going to uh, freeze. Yeah. <laughs> so they're going to freeze. And very difficult to dry them that way. So well, I don't remember. Was that something on one of the forums that we saw? So anyway, so I wanted a tumbler. Yeah, I wanted a tumbler. Okay, that that was what it was. We'd seen somebody had built a tumbler, but then Rich and I don't think this is a unique idea because I think other people have done it too. But he got an old dryer. Are you saying? I know that you're I, not you're, unique. Oh. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you're breaking my heart. <laughs> Anyway, he got an old dryer, and uh, and then he duct taped off the vent at yeah. the back, and put uh, wood shavings in it. Yeah, sawdust, sawdust, wood chips. Yeah. What I got was an old natural gas dryer, and so there's no heat involved. Yeah, really important thing to yeah. make note: there is no heat involved. You don't in want to bake them while you're doing. And if this. you happen to get an electric one, you want to convert, then make sure that you. You disconnect, remove the the heating element. Yeah. Uh, all you want, the only electricity you want, is so that it tumbles. Yeah. And you know, I can throw half a dozen rats in at a time and uh, set the tumbler just for for five minutes, pull them out, and they're very dry. Yeah. Why it's important is when you put it up on the board, is that if it's wet, then your fur mats down, and when you 
talk to a fur grader, how they grade fur, they take and grab it at the back and they just flip that, that back part, you know, cause you, you tube skin a, a muskrat. And so where the, where it comes down to the tail, they just take and flip that up and then they feel the, how, how thick the fur is back there. If it's matted down, it's a much harder thing for them to guess, you know. Or, and they don't, or, and, and that's the thing. They do so many oh. that they don't guess. They just give you a poorer grade. That's so right. if you're going to get the most for the fur that you trap, you're putting in a lot of time and effort to do all of this just to get an animal that you can put on a board. Make sure that you that you take the little bit of extra time to make sure you've got the best product to put in front of a fur grader. Actually, make it easy for him to like your fur. Yeah, that's that too. It, it, it's that simple. Okay. It's <laughs> better said. You win. <laughs> <laughs> Other than that, I mean, they are so easy to, uh, th- the fleshing on them is, is next to nothing. Mm-hmm. Lots of people use a spoon. Yep. And just, cause you're just scraping. They have very, very light, uh, uh, leather Hi. and yeah. you can, you can rip them really quick. They also have a, uh, the, um, saddle on them. Okay. Now just about every other fur, we remove the saddle when we, when we flesh, you do not on the muskrat. Yeah. They will actually do that when they do the tanning process. We have to leave the saddle on. Otherwise we end up with, a, with the, it being far too fragile. Yeah. So all we do is just get rid of the fat. So basically they got a gob of fat under each armpit, usually a, go- a gob of fat just uh, by their, b- b- below their ear underneath the jaw and a little bit of fat around what's called the skirt or at the bottom of, uh, of, of the pelt. Then it's on to, and I just use, uh, I mount on wood boards. And so I take and, uh, just pull it loosely over top of that that wooden board, and and I'll scrape it right there. I like to use a a, a hoop flesher, either. Yeah. Uh, what have I got? But very tender, like it's not like some of the other fur that we. Oh no no no! Yeah. You're going very 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 lightly, yeah. very lightly, and but I use the board itself as as its own beam. Put it yeah. that way, and you can either use uh, a wooden uh, board uh, forming board, or you can use metal wire. Wire, you know, and at one time there got to be quite a war over this. Uh, wire has its advantages. It mm-hmm. um, dries really quickly. Yeah. Okay, because you're getting good good airflow. However, most wire weren't the right size. Oh. So back in the day, when when they would actually almost throw it on a pattern to see whether it was in large or double XL yeah. or triple XL, if you didn't have the correct shape, you weren't maximizing your your grade. Once again. Your size. Yeah. yeah. So, but today it's different. Today they have a light table. Yes. And they take it, throw it down on the light table, and the computer shoots it with light and and figures out the square inches of further and gives it a size. Yeah. It's, that's pretty cool, isn't it? That is cool. So, so if you have wire and you want to use wire, go with it. Yeah. There, you know that, that that's that's the way to go. I kind of a traditionalist. I like the wood. Mm. And it's whatever you whatever you get used to and whatever you're good at. That's the other thing, right? Like, I mean, if you. If you use wood and you're good at doing it with wood, just changing it to wire, you may not get the same quality of fur at the end of the process without a lot of trial and error. Well, for me, my forming board is also my, my fleshing bean, yeah. you know, that, 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 those kind of things. You just develop your own, your own system, right? Yeah. Um, rats are stretched with the flesh out mm-hmm. and they stay that way. We don't reverse them. No. And that's why it's so very important to, uh, to, to make sure that it's dry so that that there's some volume, some fluff to that fur inside. Lots of times people will either take air or like an air hose mm-hmm. or they'll take a, like a bottle brush. Remember the uh, bottle brush we used yeah, to yeah. use, baby bottle? Don't use the one that the baby, you're, <laughs> <laughs> you're using for your baby. <laughs> Not a good idea. But they'll take and shove it up inside that, inside that, to ruffle up that fur and bulk up that fur inside yeah. that, uh, that hide, right? Yeah. All, all just systems help you get a, little, a couple more bucks. Yeah. Well, and everybody's got their own system, but if you're just learning... There's some good tips for you anyway. So we may or may not, even though we're started so early, we're, we're, we're panicking about the weather. We may, yeah. we may get, it looks like we've got, if we get through the next couple of days, other things permanently freezing the next, uh, about five days from now, six days from now, looks like we might have a warming trend. Yeah. Maybe so next weekend we'll get out to do some more. Get out and, and maybe I'll sing to you. Oh, that. <laughs> Can't wait for that. <laughs> oh come on! You're always <laughs> on and on about you need a cruise for your for your anniversary. It's our anniversary. You know, we just just celebrated, and so I'm gonna. Uh, I I always tell her that you know, it's the same as being in in Venice with the, with the gondola drivers and <laughs> yeah, and the me same. singing because <laughs> we wear toques in Venice. <laughs> oh, you're gonna go there. You're gonna go there. <laughs>
<laughs> you know. Anyway. I got rats to skin. <laughs> yeah, you do. You better go get at it. I hope you enjoyed this today. And maybe we'll see you guys down the line. <laughs>